Um, so as I said, thank you for the organizers for letting me present uh, my work here. I must confess um, that I don't really know um, what I'm here. I don't have anything with nano in my um, research. So I tried thinking very hard and, and the only thing that I could come with was that I'm working uh, with the Drosophila fruit fly, which is really, really small, but I don't think that that qualifies as nano. Um, so what I'm interested in is how sensory uh, input is being coded in the brain, processed in the brain, and eventually leads to perception and behavior. And this question is obviously being studied for years and years. And there are many theories, and the most or the, the largest problem of this, um, of this uh, research uh, field is that we, it's difficult to show causality. We can suggest neural codes, we can look if they explain um, our observations, but we cannot really say that the animals, that behaving animals are using this code. And in recent years, we can, um, there's some advancement that allows us to finally to start addressing these questions of causality in the neural code, and I'll get back to that. So in order to try and decipher the neural code, well, there are many things that are needed, and I want to focus on one thing, which is we need to know large-scale neuronal population activity. If you'll ask any experienced code breaker, he or she will tell you that in order to decipher code, you need two things. You need to have a large sample of the code that you want to decipher, and then you need to be able to play with it to cause these causality changes. And this is a very difficult task. If you think of mice, for example, the olfactory system of mice, even at the first layer, there are more than 1,000 different types of receptor neurons, and already at the second layer, tens and tens of thousands of neurons, and it is very difficult to get a large sample of, of this population activity. And that's where Drosophila comes. Uh, the Drosophila has a very small brain. It's between 100,000 to 200,000 neurons, depending who counts. And in some systems, for example, in the olfactory system, we have only 50 types of receptors, and the second layer is only 100 neurons. And so these are numbers that we can count to, and we can really measure their activities. And I'm interested in, or at this research, we were interested in two questions. The first is uh, rate code coding versus temporal code. So rate code, as it says, just the rate, the firing frequencies of neurons, 10 hertz, 50 hertz, 100 hertz, that's the base. The, uh, the base that underlies uh, neural code. Temporal code is slightly different. In temporal code, it's the spike timing that is important. So if you look at the, these three examples, they have the same number of spikes in the same period of time, so they all have the same rate code, but they clearly have a different pattern. And so under temporal code um, coding regime, these will all code different things. And you can immediately see that the temporal code um, coding space is much larger, and in recent years there is a shift in neuroscience towards temporal coding. But again, we don't have the causality. So we cannot, until recently, we could not show where the temporal codes are really used by behaving animals. So we wanted to look at that. Uh, we started with the easier one, we started with rate code, um, and I'll get to that in, in a few slides. The second question, was what's called label line theory, and for that I'll need one slide of explaining about the Drosophila olfactory system. So odors activate receptor neurons that are located in, in the antenna and the maxillary pulp. In Drosophila there are 50 types, and um, these receptor neurons send the axons to a brain region called the antenna lobe, where they sign up on second order neurons called projection neurons, and there's, these neurons are excitatory, and then these neurons send axons to two brain regions. One is the mushroom body, which was shown to be responsible for learning and memory. And the other one is the lateral horn, which at the time, uh, its function was not entirely clear. It was suggested to be involved in naive behavior. And this is how it looks. So here we stained 
the second order projection neurons. These are the cell bodies. This is the antenna lobe, and this is the nerve going to mushroom body and lateral horn. Now, all, uh, each receptor neuron expresses a single type of receptor. And all the neurons, all the receptor neurons that express the same receptor, they all project um, to the same location in the antenna lobe called glomerulus. And every second order neuron sends its dendrites to only one glomerulus. There is actually a line going from the antenna directly to the mushroom body and lateral horn uh, from specific a uh, specific receptor through a specific sec second order neuron and going all the way to higher brain regions. And so we have 50 lines like that. And when people examined um, special cases, for example, pheromones, pheromones activate one, one of these receptors. It's only activated by pheromones. Pheromones only activate this receptor, so there's a one line which is activated, both in males and females, going all the way to high brain regions and causes uh, behavior. And also CO2, which is released by stressed flies. So that signals danger, and when there's CO2, it activates one of these labeled lines, and it overrides everything, and the flies will escape. So what about other orders? It was suggested that uh, flies, they like apple cider vinegar, and it was demonstrated that at low concentration, they activate one of these lines, and then at high concentration, which they, sorry, they don't really like, um, another line is activated, and again, it overrides the rest of the activity, and flies avoid that. So the suggestion was that basically all function is just labeled lines that um, are activated and uh, causes either attraction or, or aversion. And this is, um, it was suggested for flies. And this is very problematic. It really limits the coding space, and it's basically based on a go, no go response. And so we wanted to see if that is correct as well. And uh, luckily for us, there was this uh, amazing paper that came out in 2006, and they um, measured the response of 24 out of the 50 receptor types in flies in response to 110 different orders. And here you see three examples. So this, for example, is the frequency response of 24 different types of receptors in response to this order. So we have this vector describing this order. And you can see that we have different vectors describing different orders. And then another useful paper came out um, where here, 2010. And they showed how to take these vectors and apply a transformation and calculate the neural activity, the neural responses of the second order neurons. So we get new vectors, they're different, they're still rate codes, um, they're calculated, not measured, um, and, and this is what we had to work with. So we took these vectors and then we decided to um, see how orders, if these are correct, how orders are similar or dissimilar, and if we reduce that from 24 dimension to just two dimensional example, uh, this order has a high firing frequency in this second order neuron and, and low in this one, whereas this one has a high firing frequency in the second uh, neuron and low in this one. And so these two are very different orders and we want something that will capture that. So one measurement is the cosine distance, which captures that, another is the Euclidean distance, there are many other measurements and in in the antenna lobe of flies, they're all actually quite similar and behave similarly. So from now, we work with everything, but for now on, I'll just show the cosine distance. So the first thing that we had to measure is if these calculated distances really still capture the physiology. We took measurements from one study, a transformation from another study, we calculated some sort of distance. Did we mess too much? Um, and since we are looking at firing frequencies of the second order neurons, we wanted to look at the activity at the output of these neurons, so in this brain region called the lateral horn. And to do that, this is our setup. Uh, we take a live awake behaving fly, we expose the brain, and then we can do either two photon functional imaging or electrophysiology while we give auto stimuli. And um, recently we added to this setup a tracking ball, and so the flies walk on the ball, and so we also get the behavioral output um, while we measure the brain activity. 
And um, in order to target the specific neurons that we're interested in, we're using a, a method similar to the CRELOX that was presented. So very briefly, this is the GALF for UAS system. Um, both of these are from yeast, and GALF4 is a transcription factor, and UAS is the promoter that it binds to. And when these two are together, then we have expression of gene of interest in the neurons that we wanted, and the advantage that we have in flies is that fly generation is only 10 days. So very easily we can set up whichever cross that we want. And here you see an example. Um, we have lots of libraries of flies. We have about uh, 20,000 driver lines and many more um, target uh, proteins. And here you see that using these um, driver lines, we can either label from single neurons in each hemisphere up to the entire uh, antenna lobe. And I don't need to explain calcium imaging, so I'll skip that. And so we did calcium imaging here to measure physiological responses of orders, and we did seven orders. And then we calculated, these are the two photon um, activity maps, and we calculated all the distances between physiological responses, and we plotted them as a function of the cosine distance, and surprisingly enough, there was quite a good uh, correlation. And so from now on, we said, okay, the database is fine, our transformation is fine, and we can start using the entire database. Okay, so now we want to link this neural code, these rate codes, to behavior, and specifically these distances between order activity vectors. And for that, uh, this is a setup. Uh, there are 20 chambers. Each chamber hosts a single fly. Flies are working freely inside the chambers, and we can give different orders from both sides and we can also give electric shock. And this is how it looks, while well, the flies are walking happily in their, inside their chambers. And from such an experiment, this, are the, um, this is the output that we get. So here I only present five flies. Um, this is the trajectory of the fly. This is time. And so this is the middle of the chamber, then left, right, and here's where we give orders. Just for the sake of the example, here I show you a very attractive order and a very aversive order, and you see that when we give the orders, flies go only to one side of the chamber, and we always swap the orders just to make sure, and you see that when we swap the orders, the flies change their uh, location. So we did 51 such experiments, 51 order pairs, and here you see the decision bias plotted as a function of the cosine distance, and a decision bias of zero indicates that there's no preference. They go equally to both sides. And the decision bias of 100 means that they go only to one side. And you can immediately see that at low distances, um, there's no bias or, or very small bias. And then this bias increases as the distance increases. And at some point, we reach some upper plateau. And the most straightforward way to explain that is by discrimination. So here, flies just having problem trouble discriminating, and then discrimination becomes easier, and then at some point, the distance between the orders is not a limiting factor anymore, and they don't have any problems to discriminate. You can also explain that with preference. So two orders that initiate the same activity in receptors, well, they will initiate the same preference, and we did our best to control for that. Uh, I'm not going to show that, uh, but we don't think that what we see here is preference. We think that we see discrimination. And then, oh, sorry, so we have this um, distance discrimination curve that sets an upper bound on behavior. You can only behave as good as you discriminate. And then this gives a prediction. If we could manipulate the distance between these uh, orders, then according to the initial conditions, we will have different behavioral results. If the distance is very large, decreasing the distance will have no effect. We will just move on the upper plateau. But if the distance is in the rising phase, decreasing the distance will decrease di discrimination and we'll see a drop in behavior. So I'm not just suggesting, we can clearly do that. And one way to do that is by silencing one of these lines or one of these PNs. And when you do that, you decrease the distance between the vectors. And in order to silence neurons, we use these uh, temperature um, um, dependent protein, which is uh, called shibiri. Normally, shibiri is responsible for the recycle of vesicles, so at the permissive temperature, everything is fine. And when we shift the flies to the restrictive temperature, we block recycle vesicles, 
And then even when action potentials arrive, they don't cause any release. So this neuron becomes silent. And we found um, two driver lines that have expression in very few of these second order neurons, of these projection neurons. So here, three, only three of these projection neurons, and here, only seven. And we did the control at the permissive temperature, 25 degrees, and they follow this distance discrimination curve. And then when we shift the flies to 32 degrees, we see that our expectation um, was realized. And we see that the largest distances, we don't see a decrease in um, discrimination, but we do see a decrease in the rising phase. So the distance discrimination function sets an upper bound on order discrimination and fairly accurately predicts behavioral responses. And as for the labeled lines, labeled lines cannot explain such a graded um, effect. It's either go or no go. Okay, so now we wanted to see how are the different brain regions uh, involved in this um, task that, uh, or behavioral task that we did. So here it is the antenna lobe, the second order neurons. This is the mushroom body where learning and memory occurs. And this is the lateral horn that was believed or, or thought to be for naive discrimination. And these are the results that I showed you already. And from now on, I'll keep the red curve, which is wild type, and I'll put the new results on that. So first, we blocked, again, using this shibiri, we blocked the mushroom body, and there's no effect, which is fine. Then we wanted to engage the mushroom body, and when we, so we give an electric shock against one of the orders, and then we check for discrimination, and when mushroom body is involved, the flies discriminate perfectly. This is actually the closest order pair that we could find in the database. So there are 110 orders, there are almost 6,000 order pairs. This is the closest one, flies discriminate perfectly. Now, if we add the training and block the mushroom body, so we do the training at 25 degrees and then shift the flies to 32 and block mushroom body, we return back to this naive behavior curve. So we have these two maps, one in the lateral horn, which is initiates this response, one in the mushroom body which initiates this response, they both exist, and for some reason, which we don't know, flies don't use the mushroom body, they use lateral horn information, and only when there's some motivational incentive, like not getting shocked, they do engage the mushroom body. Okay, I didn't tell you up to now, I showed you these excitatory neurons here, I will show them again in a second. But in addition to these excitatory neurons, there's another group of second order neurons. Um, they lie ventrally to the antenna lobe, they bypass the mushroom body, and they go directly to the lateral horn. So since we found that the lateral horn is relevant for our, for our behavioral task, we thought that these would be interesting. And, oh, sorry, and this is the overlay of the two. Uh, images, so these are the excitatory going to mushroom body and lateral horn, and this is the new group of neurons. So first we had to characterize them, so we stand for a lot of different uh, neurotransmitters, and they turned out to be GABAergic, so they're inhibitory and not excitatory. Um, we wanted to check the polarity, so we express dendritic markers and axonal markers, and their polarity is as expected, so they do receive their input in the antenna lobe and send their axons to the uh, lateral horn, and then we wanted to see their activity, and um, they have um, a scaled response or a balanced inhibition. So odors, they activate different numbers of receptors. Some odors activate only four receptors in the, in the database, and, some, and they are narrow odors. Some odors are very broad, activating all of the receptors, or almost all of the receptors. And the excitatory projection neurons, they get saturated quite quickly. Um, reaching 150 to 200 hertz almost uh, instantaneously. Whereas these neurons, their responses grow gradually with the broadness of the order. So they respond entirely differently than the projection neurons. So we can add this uh, inhibitory line to this uh, diagram, and so we wanted to check what they do. So we go back to this experiment. This is the control at 25 degrees and they behave fine. And then when we shift the flies to 32 degrees, we see a large reduction in discrimination, but only for the low distances. We see hardly any effect at the large distances, just, just a few dot that we should have erased. Um, so no effect here. 
So how can we explain that? How can we explain that the inhibition affects only the low distances? So if you go back to this example, if we could leave the high firing frequency here on this axis with, without affecting it and reduce only the low firing frequency, so drop this here and move this here, then we increase the distance, both the cosine distance and the Euclidean distance. So this is a sort of a high pass filter. So we wanted to see if these neurons actually execute a high pass filter on the system. And for that, we, to control this, the firing frequency, we electrically stimulated the nerve just below, uh, before the release sites. And then we measured synaptic release uh, from the axons, from the second order axons. And for that, we use a tool called synaptofluorine. This protein is expressed in the vesicles, we are, which are acidic, and then it has some low fluorescence. And then when there's vesicle release and it's being exposed to the more basic environment, it uh, gives some fluorescence uh, signal. Here you see an example of such an experiment. So this is a basic experiment. We stimulated these different frequencies, and you see that we have an increase in synaptic release. And then we just dumped uh, GABA to the bath chamber, and uh, you see, well, at least it looks in the eye, that there is a decrease here, but there is no decrease here. And when we analyze that, and this is an average of a few such experiments, you see that indeed there is a reduction at 40 hertz and nothing at 160 hertz. And to better quantify that, we took the ratio between release with GABA and without GABA. And you see that indeed GABA initiates a high pass filter on the system and reduces the release only at low frequencies, but leave the high frequencies unattenuated. But this was just GABA that we dumped on the bath. It was not sure that this is what the inhibitory projection neurons are doing. So we wanted to check that. And now being ambassador of Trusophila, I want to show you where optogenetics was really developed. Um, so optogenetics, I'm sure you all know, um, we take channels that are activated by light. And when they're closed, they have no effect. And when they're gated, when we open them, they can cause depolarization and then initiate action potentials and they can be activated by blue or red light and they're also inhibitor runs. And this is the first experiment that was done at the lab of, of Misenbock. And you know when you want to try to catch a fly, they always escape. This is the escape response is caused by two neurons that um, project to the wings and to the legs. They cause the flies to jump and start flapping the wings. And you see that whenever they give the pulse of light, flies, the fly jumps and starts waving the wings. But you can also say, well, they see the light, so the light initiates, um, the eyes initiate the escape response. So they did the very crude but efficient control. They decapitated the flies. And you give the light and flies jump and flap their wings and fly away. So this is the excitatory control, and we can do that at a resolution of just a few milliseconds. And then, as I said, there are also inhibitory tools that block action potentials. And here is uh, such an example. And when they'll give light in these two cases, you'll see all the flies drop. These are the motor neurons. And when, oh, I won't leave the movie all the way, but when they'll turn off the light, the flies will just start climbing uh, back again. So using these tools or similar tools of thermogenetics, we activated the inhibitory projection neurons, and we measured the release from the excitatory projection neurons, and we get the same results. So basically, the inhibitory neurons, they attenuate um, the low firing frequencies, and they leave the high firing frequencies unattenuated. Okay, so the last thing that, to complete this, we need to show is that this really causes an increase in the distances, and that we can predict the behavior uh, with that. So now we turn to a very simple model. We took these vectors that we had. We then took the high pass filter that we measured physiologically. We also took the recruitments of the inhibitory projection neurons that we measured physiologically. We combined these two to generate an order specific um, filter. And then we apply this order specific filter to each order. So in this case, this would be the new vector, and so the low firing frequencies are attenuated and the high ones are left uh, 
sorry, yeah, unatten unattenuated. And we then took these new vectors and we calculated the distances between them. And all the distances except 10 or so are increased. And then is this increase in distance sufficient to explain behavior? So these are the curves that I showed you. This is the red wild type curve. This is the curve when we blocked the projection neurons. And we wanted to see if we can move from this curve to this curve just by changing the distance. And yes, we can. So before I conclude, why scaled inhibition? So if the, the, the scaled inhibition comes to um, deal with two competing demands, one is sensitivity, whereas, and the other is contrast. So if we have some very low concentration, and these are the responses without inhibition, so if we have full inhibition, if we engage the inhibitory neurons like the excitatory neurons are, are being engaged, then we'll just block the signal and we will lose sensitivity. If, on the other hand, we won't engage them, then we keep the signal. So maybe we can discriminate a bit less good, but at least we have sensitivity. In high concentrations, we, we, have, we don't need sensitivity anymore, and now we can use the full inhibition. So that's the advantage of a scaled inhibition. So what I showed you is that um, the projection neurons, the second order neurons output is sufficient to predict uh, naive behavior, and the distance sets an upper bound on discrimination. Um, there are two order representations in the brain, and it's motivational state that determines which order representation is used. Inhibition separates auto signals. Um, high pass filtering underlies the inhibition effect, and the high pass filter increases the distances between uh, auto pairs. Um, rate code predicts behavior, but only to some extent. Um, it sets an upper bound, but we totally failed in predicting what's happening under the curve. And now we're basically repeating this entire uh, research with temporal code, so we're mapping all the neurons' temporal responses, defining the code again with temporal codes rather than rate codes, and try to manipulate the neural code and see the effect on behavior. And label lines, um, it's just wrong. We cannot explain the fly's behavior with label line theories, and actually following this uh, work, there was another paper um, which improved our model by adding some nonlinear normalization, and that managed to predict fly's behavior, um, the valence of fly behavior, very, very nicely. Um, this was done during my postdoc, so in Oxford, and these are the people who helped me, and then with a brief, uh, very sharp change uh, to here, and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Any questions? So how, how relevant is it to, to a human situation where the, it's more complex uh, in the sensing machinery? So actually, flies and humans have the exact same principles of full function coding as far as we know. So um, olfactory bulb is exactly similar to antenna lobe, and then pure from cortex in terms of neural coding is exactly similar to mushroom body, and amygdala probably exactly similar to the lateral horn. So that's what we know from now. Okay.